we know nothing is going to happen in, with the way things are. We cannot afford the status quo, in my view. So that's why I'm really keen to have you here. The work that, that Chris has been doing and give you a chance uh, to get insight into the thinking that we've got. So Chris, I am going to hand over to you and thank you so much. And I hope I was efficient and I know you will be too. Certainly. Well, thank you very much, Susan, for the invitation uh, to come tonight. And as you said, Susan, we were planning on doing this in a face-to-face -face fashion. I was going to spend all day in the Blue Mountains today, but alas, that's not to be. You're in Canberra in lockdown. I'm in my house in Smithfield in Western Sydney in lockdown, and we just couldn't do it. But uh, we are nevertheless uh, able to proceed this way, and I'll be back in person another time. I also want to acknowledge the fact that I'm also on Darragh land. Um, uh, my uh, home in Smithfield is on the land of the Cabrical people of the Darragh Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and of course, commit myself, as I know we all are, and our party is to the task of eradicating Indigenous disadvantage in Australia. Well, this has been in our diary for some time, um, but uh, fortuitously, uh, is this uh, Zoom comes mm -hmm. on the uh, in the aftermath of the IPCC report, I'm not going to dwell on the report tonight because I want to talk a little bit about how we win the climate change debate, but um, I do think it's important to acknowledge the report. And uh, my, my formulation, uh, Susan, is that it is unsurprising yet shocking all at the same time. It can be both things. It's completely and utterly unsurprising because we've known for a long time, this is where the science is going, we've known for a long time that this is what the... Uh, what the findings would be and the important thing to note about the IPCC report when you're arguing perhaps with your friends, neighbours and families who might not see it quite the same way is that it is not an extremist view, it is not a forward-leaning view, it is not a radical view. The IPCC report is actually a consensus view among scientists. It's, if you like, an averaging of the scientific uh, expectations that um, the uh, scientific experts have uh, in relation to what is happening and of course um, that is singularly unsurprising that the reports were report was so forward leaning, despite the fact it was just simply an averaging of the scientific uh, consensus. Because we know that climate change has moved from a theory to a prediction to a lived reality, and we're living and breathing it now every day, including what we're seeing in Greece and and what we've lived through in Australia as well. And of course, the report also highlights the impact on Australia. And if you are looking for something to do and are thinking about the IPCC report, but don't perhaps want to tackle the whole thing, I'd recommend that you go and online and find the appendix, which is the regional implications for Australasia. It's only a one page part of the report, but it is well worth reading because it runs through the implications for Australia and certainly the fact that Australia has the most to gain uh, amongst nations from action on climate change and the most to lose from inaction. But what I really wanted to start us off by talking about tonight, Susan, because I can answer questions about anything really within the portfolio, so I won't try and cover the field. But I do want to talk a little bit about how we win the argument for real action on climate change, because I think that's really the key. We can talk about the details, we can talk about the level of ambition, we can talk about all those sorts of things. But I want to talk about how we win the argument, because as you know, for the better part of two decades, Australia has been in a toxic race to the bottom on climate change policy. We have been the only country in the world which has implemented a carbon price and then repealed it. And we've been engaged in this identity politics where our opponents split Australians, divide Australians. They say that, you know, regional Australians will pay the price of action to assuage the consciences of those in inner cities that somehow people in the regions don't care about climate change action. That's gonna come at a great cost to your job. And remember, we went to the last election with a very good climate change policy and all we got, all we got basically through the entire campaign. And I was on the 6 a.m. calls of the leadership group, which met every single day of the election campaign to talk about what the incoming attacks were. It was what's the cost of policy, what's the cost of climate change action, what's the cost in the regions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to win that argument. Now, we win that argument, in my view, by arguing with every fibre of our being and at every opportunity that action on climate change is in the interest, in the best economic interest of our country. Yes, it's a moral argument. Yes, there's a moral obligation on us to act. Of course there is, and we can talk about that tonight. You know, some people say Australia shouldn't act because we're only 1% of global emissions. Well, despite the fact we're actually the world's largest emitter per capita, what I actually think is more compelling is that we're the 14th largest emitter in absolute terms. So that, that means there's 176 countries below us in emissions. So are we arguing that the 13 countries above us 
uh, in emissions um, should uh, should stop emitting or reduce emissions, but us and the other 177 should not. That's ridiculous. So there's a moral case. There's an, a case for international affairs and international relations. You know, we are more out of touch with our usually like-minded colleagues uh, around the world on climate change than we have been on any single issue in foreign affairs and international relations since the war. There is not one where we've been more out of touch than we are. Uh, and then we are at the moment on climate change. But all that is important, but it's not how we win the argument in Australia. We win the argument in Australia, in my view, by breaking through that toxic politics and winning the argument that here is uh, something which is in our country's best interest. Not we do, We're not doing it because it's the right thing to do internationally. We're doing it because it's good for our country and good for jobs and good for the economy. The, again, our opponents argue that somehow action on climate change comes at a cost and a cost of economic growth and jobs. I see action on climate change as the absolutely essential bedrock for good economic growth and for good jobs and good jobs spread across the regions. Uh, the regions that have powered Australia for so long um, with traditional energy, with coal and gas, are the same regions which will power us into the future. And I want to present at the election an optimistic view of Australia's future, a bright, forward-looking, upward-looking view of Australia as a renewable energy powerhouse, one which is generating more energy than we need. You know, the key to action on climate change is to electrify everything that can be electrified, to electrify home heating, to electrify industrial processes, anything that can be electrified, and to make that renewable, to make that energy renewable, but also to then go beyond that and to export that energy. I'm not interested in 100% renewables. I'm interested in 700% renewables, exporting, keeping Australia's regions powering our exports through hydrogen, through cables. Uh, there's any number of opportunities. And again, those jobs will be in the regional areas, the areas with the room for solar panels, the room for large wind installations with the access to the electricity grid. So we have, we have a great opportunity uh, to win that argument, in my view. We're at a, an inflection point. I think that the the circumstances are right for us to take that argument up about the economic opportunity, about how we have opportunities in Australia for lithium. You know, um, in Australia, the lithium we produce has created around $213 billion worth of value, but, you know, less than 1%, around half of 1% has, of that has been realised in Australia. Lithium is, is the absolutely essential part of batteries for electric vehicles and household batteries. We are the world's largest producer of lithium. This is a massive opportunity and a massive opportunity for us to add value. We can add value in manufacturing, making more of these things in Australia. You know, we've put 60 million solar panels on roof and roofs in Australia over the last 10 years and less than 1% of them have been made in Australia. That is, it is unthinkable that we would let that continue. We are going to put many multiples of 60 million uh, panels on our roofs over the next 10 years as we move from having one in four houses with solar panels to much closer than four in four houses with solar panels. But we can win this argument in our economic interest if we do things like make more solar panels in Australia. And there's only one solar panel manufacturer in Australia, in Adelaide. Uh, we should have multiple solar panel manufacturers. We should have multiple battery manufacturers. We should have uh, people involved in the production of wind turbines in Australia. So we can and I believe under a Labor government, we'll do all those things, but we've got to bring together industry policy, regional development policy and climate policy. And we've got it at every opportunity. And, you know, I, I say it in every single interview I do, basically, as Susan would attest, almost every speech I make, every interview or press release I put out, the world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. And both are the essential ingredients to winning. Simply winning the argument that there's a climate emergency will not win us the argument on climate change in Australia. We've got to provide the, the if you like, the urgency, the, the emergency, but people have got enough stress in their lives, particularly at the moment, they don't want to hear more doom and gloom. We've got to provide them the optimism as well. And the optimism is that it's our jobs opportunity and we can certainly win that argument uh, and win it well and win an election on climate change policy. None of this is to argue for reduced ambition. None of this is to argue that we should have somehow a paired back approach. It's about how we argue it and what we focus on in the arguments and how we frame our policies. And certainly we've started to announce some, I'm not gonna talk about them now, I can answer questions. We've announced more policies in climate change than we have on any other policy area over the course of this year. There has not been one other policy area where we've announced as much detail as we have on climate change, but it's a small proportion of what we have to go. And you'll see us rolling out in coming weeks and months as well. 
hasn't been real conducive to uh, announcing policy over the previous last few weeks. We had a bit lined up to go, but we've been able to do that. But it is, you know, high state of readiness to roll a lot more detail out uh, and uh, to provide a real opportunity for the election <laughs> campaign, the election platform to be an alternative, not an echo, a real alternative when it comes to climate change. But the key is to win that optimistic argument about our economic future as a renewable energy powerhouse. Susan, I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. Chris, I've spoken about uh, any number of things, but I want to have time for a conversation. There are questions coming in thick and fast. Um, and, and look, I'm, there's probably not a big structure to what I'm doing. I'm just going to read them as they're coming through. Um, so Roy asks, Chris, I know you have to walk the tightrope between coal workers and climate reality advocates. Can you explain how you're going to balance this for the sake of our future? Well, you balance it with honesty, uh, Roy. You balance it with, with winning the, the saying the same things and running the same arguments, uh, regardless of your audience. Now, that, those remarks I've just given you, I've given similar remarks at town halls in Emerald in Queensland, which is a coal mining centre. Um, I've given similar remarks in inner city Sydney and Melbourne um, because I happen to believe it's true. And I believe if we win this argument in the areas where it's hardest, i.e. coal mining areas, we will win the election and we'll win the debate about coal mining, about, about climate change and coal mining. Uh, but at its core is honesty. At its core is honesty. I believe in being honest with people. And so that means sometimes difficult conversations, including with coal miners and people in coal-fired power stations. You know, um, I, I could have avoided a trip to the Yalorn power station, which is scheduled to close. I didn't have to go. Would have been no criticism of me if I didn't. I, I took the view I should go and look the people in the eye, in this case, mainly men, who are working in the, in the coal-fired power station who've been told they will lose their jobs. And frankly, they will lose their jobs because of us moving to a much more renewable economy. And say to them, there is no future for coal-fired power in, station, in Australia. You, this um, coal-fired power station will close and it will not be replaced with another one. And so there will not be the same jobs in coal fire power as there are have been for the last few years or last decades in, into the future. It's just not gonna happen. So the key is for you and your kids who you want to work in the sector and in this economy to create alternatives. Now that's a conversation which goes well because these aren't stupid people. You know, these are people who get it. They know that there is change in the world, that the world is moving away from this area. They have strong and clear demands of policymakers about how it's handled, and I think they're reasonable. I've heard them, you know, firsthand, and they're often put to me in quite strong language in regional parts of Australia about um, not only the need for retraining, but the need for guaranteed jobs at the end of it. And I take all that in, and I hear it, and I, you know, provide feedback to them as well. But there's no point pretending that somehow we aren't going to engage in this change. But absolutely, they must be the centre. I, other, Roy wasn't putting it this way. But some people in other forums say, well, look, just tell them their jobs are gone and they're just going to have to deal with it. I utterly reject that. It is disrespectful to them. We have to embrace them. They have a right. They have a right to be considered as we put our climate change policy together. And that right is to have alternative jobs and retraining and um, the futures of their community right at the forefront of our policy. And, and that leads to a question um, that's come from Serena and Lily. Uh, and can I just say, I watched Labor as a young journalist. I watched Labor do this in the 80s with the textiles, clothing and footwear industry. Uh, it was a perfect no, but it was a, a really different way of engaging with workers whose, whose futures were changing. Um, so Serena and Lily say Lithgow's paying attention right now as they've learned they could attract billion of, billions of dollars of investment into the region through renewables. Uh, and, you know, the question is about our support. There's obviously opportunities in those communities and the one closest to home for us. My, my electorate, you've got people here from the mountains and the Hawkesbury. My electorate hits the Hunter. It obviously hits Clare um, and those communities, Lithgow in particular, um, you know, they, they want to know as well. And we have many people who live in the Blue Mountains, but who work in Lithgow. So, so yeah, so, so what's your um, thoughts around places yeah. like Lithgow? Yeah, and I've met with the Mayor and CEO of Lithgow Council, uh, and they completely get it. Uh, Indeed, and I think meeting. I sent them your way. You did. You sent them to me, uh, Susan, and uh, we had a good meeting. And I say that I think that meeting would have been, uh, would, would, have, would have been a lot different five years ago. You know, I think that yeah. communities like that have moved a long way 
to getting that this is where the world is heading and you can pretend it's not happening or you can embrace alternative industries and you know the, the mayor there was sort of a traditional sort of regional mayor pretty sort of straightforward in his view um views but you know he completely got it and so he would um he he completely gets that and i gotta say that is not an uncommon experience for me you know i met with every mayor in the rock the regional organization of council the bowen basin in central queensland you couldn't get a more traditional coal mining in uh, part of australia than the bowen basin and the mayors and you know they were frankly crusty old national party mayors and independent mayors who come from small country towns in queensland I had no problem making these arguments to them. I found a receptive audience. It, again, they get it. This is where the world's heading. And if you take people like that with you on this journey, uh, I believe we can win the, win the argument. What you don't do is convince them by sending convoys up, you know, in the in election campaign, um, you know, to moralise to people that their jobs are somehow immoral. That's not how you win people over. Mm. Um, and, and Jess uh, follows up on that and says, so how will you support these areas to reskill people who currently work in the fossil fuel industry? Uh, and and that there's, she's also asked about electric vehicles. We might park the electric vehicles, sorry for the pun, because um, there will be questions, a whole bunch about that. But just in terms of the reskilling, um, that, that is what we've, we've really started thinking about the reskilling and the skilling of new people that we need, haven't we? Yeah, we have, uh, and we've got some policies we've already announced there and much more to come. So more focused at younger people. I know this isn't where the question was going, but just for the sake of completeness, more fo not, not exclusively focused at younger people, but more focused at younger people is our new energy apprentices policy we've already announced, which is 10,000 apprenticeships um, uh, over, the, over the country uh, to deal with new energy skills and that where they are necessary. They're already renewable energy firms who are reporting shortages of skills so you know they have the opposite problem um that they are desperate for more workers and that is just the tip of the iceberg we're going to need massive investments in energy efficiency which is highly labor intensive which is a highly skilled specialized skilled area so we'll have ten thousand new energy apprentices that's ten thousand dollar payments to those ten thousand energy apprentices also in now uh, more directly on the question you know we've done a lot of thinking about the architecture about regional development and, and investment and retraining about how we Get the, get the policy mix right in terms of top, um, you know, bottom up ideas as opposed to being imposed from Canberra about what we can do to ensure smooth processes. So, for example, when Hazelwood closed, it goes six months notice. It, uh, absolute disaster for that community. Six months is a blink of an eye in terms of getting ready for a thing like that. Your lawn is given seven years notice. That gives us the opportunity to get these things right. Uh, that'll be a much a better process there and they're the sorts of things that we can insist upon and then we can work with the with the sector so you'll see a lot more detail around uh, around that sort of approach from us now i'm going to there's a few sort of separate questions here one is around the Ener energy security board and sandra says in July, they submitted um, the 2025 electricity market design to National Cabinet. Have you been briefed? And what's your view on the, how the ESB's vision helps us reduce emissions? No, I have not been briefed and mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be briefed by uh, Minister Taylor. Um, it's not something that he generally engages in. Um, they wanted us to be bipartisan, Chris. Yes, but they don't want us to have any information. Susan, to provide bipartisanship means, you know, yes, uh, according to them. Um, look, uh, look. These are, these they do do by and large, we're not at all points. And the other things I disagree with, I don't agree with the um, so called sun tax. I know that's not what the question is about, but you know, that's one example of an idea which floats up through the system and I have a problem with. Um, the ISP, I think, is a good document um, in terms of the transmission grid upgrade, and that would be we actually would fund a lot of things in the ISP through our Rewiring the Nation uh, fund, which is a $20 billion fund to improve transmission, uh, which is very, very important. Not very sexy, but, you know, very important because we're going to need to get the renewable energy to where it's going to be need, used. But um, I, I have concerns about, you know, so-called reliability payments, etc. I, I do think that that is problematic. It's more on the question. I think that's problematic, but you know, I haven't been briefed and I'm letting the process run for a little while longer. Yeah, Chris, you talk about the rewiring the nation 
a policy as not being sexy. I must read all your transcripts because I use the same phrase. Um, but it is absolutely fundamental. And, and I feel like so, what we're really focused on is the practical things rather than, as you say, having the argument. We know climate change is real. We're not, we're not needing to prosecute that again. It's about putting the practical things in place. And that's a policy we've announced, uh, I don't know, that was a budget mm. two ago or, you know, um, is that, is that what people should expect? There's really practical things to come out that, that form a portfolio of tangible actions. Yes. Um, so just, just on the policy itself and then how our, our approach is, it's, very, it's vital, as I said. You, know, you, could put, you could massively improve your renewable energy generation unless you've upgraded the grid. It's not gonna, we, we, the system's going to crash. We're going to massively upgrade the grid. That's why we've allocated $20 billion to upgrade the grid to support that new renewable energy. We're the only people who will do it. The government's not doing it. Um, but yes, that is the sort of a practical approach you should see. You, you will see under our policies, a sector by sector approach. I know we're not talking about electric vehicles yet, but we started to announce our electric vehicle policy. There's more to do, but really sort of focused on, on results and achievement. Another one is our community batteries policy. I said before, we've got one in four Australian houses with solar panels on the roof, but we've got one in 60 with a battery because they're very expensive. So, but we're missing it, therefore we're missing out on that storage. But a community battery, which is, you know, the size of a car down the park, which allows families to feed in and feed out, provides them really with a, their own battery in a way which is not economic for them. Again, it's a practical measure. So what you'll see is, uh, I haven't been asked you about targets, maybe I will be, but I'll, I'll preempt the question by saying, you will see our levels of ambition uh, and you will see a very strong roadmap because we can't get to net zero by 2050, by starting by 2049. And by the way, even if you could, it's not good enough because it's the it's the total of emissions between now and 2050 that counts, not what we happen to be emitting in 2050. Net zero by 2050 is just the starting point. It's just the bare minimum. So you'll see those levels of ambition, but more importantly, you'll see the policy levers sector by sector to achieve it under us. That's what that's what I spend you know a lot of time uh, working on that really detailed policy, because I could announce, you know, emissions reduction target of 100% by 2025, wouldn't mean anything you know, if, if I didn't have the policies to achieve it. So you'll mm. see both. Okay, the Zali Stegel bill. Zali put forward the bill to establish new bodies to advise the government on emissions. You know the bill. Um, what, and to, this one is specifically about um, target strategies and budgets like the climate change commissions in the UK and NZ where a lot of progress has obviously been made. Um, what's, what's your view about that bill? So um, the first thing to say is that and I fully respect Zali's right and you know to, to put it forward but as you know Susan as we know um, it is a it is a exercise in futility because a, a private member's bill is never voted on just as a statement of fact as much as I'd like to vote on it and you'd like to vote on it, Susan, it will never come to a vote. If Zali moved a suspension of standing orders to ensure that it did get a vote, we would vote for it. Mm. But we would lose because all the independence plus us still is not a majority in the House of Representatives. So my fundamental point is legislation is important, but legislation introduced by a minister in a Labor government that gets voted upon and carried is what makes a difference, not legislation moved by an independent, which is never even voted on or discussed or debated. Zali knows that. It's not a criticism mm. of her. She, she's got to find a way to, to progress her arguments and moving a private member's bill is a perfectly legitimate way of her doing it, but it's not a way of getting a law onto the statute books. And she knows that too. Um, now, what's in, the, what's in the bill is fine. You know, it's not how I write it all, et cetera, et cetera, but it's fine. Um, the government has gutted the Climate Change Authority. They've reduced the staff to, I think, seven people last time I looked. You know, there are, there are minor divisions in minor agencies with more people than that. They've, um, you know, uh, certainly stacked the boards of all the sort of government agencies that are involved in climate change with people whom I would never appoint, etc. cetera. Um, so having an independent process like the CCA is one we established in government and you should expect that to be reflected in our policies and those sorts of things are, the Zali's approach and our approach, you would find a relatively high degree of alignment, um, but the way to do it is not a private member's bill. I'll move a climate change bill as climate change minister in a government and it'll be voted upon and carried and that's how you change the law. I like the sound of that. Um, okay, the uh, Glasgow targets. Um, I'm just trying to find this question from David Ward. Uh, 
will the he does mention the morally bankrupt libs and nats on this issue it's just kind of a given <laughs> will will the alp um present a better alternative leading up to and during the glasgow summit and cut well, it, and use that as an opportunity is his yeah, question yes and um you should certainly you know obviously there'll be plenty of opportunities for me to comment and i'll be saying more in coming days and weeks there you go won't give away won't give it all away now um, okay, gas. Let's talk gas. Um, David Gregory uh, asks, gas as a transition to fuel, what's the position? And he's concerned about fugitive emissions, which need to be tightly regulated. So I don't like the use of the term gas as a transition fuel. I don't see it that way. I don't think it's a transition fuel as such because it's not a low emissions fuel. Um, it's lower emissions than coal on most calculations in most instances, um, but it's not uh, it's not a transition fuel. It's not the answer. Um, it would be better if we could move more quickly. Having said that, uh, let's just be frank about gas. Gas has a role to play. Let me make a couple of points about gas. I might spend a minute on this because it's a big topic, Susan. Yes. But firstly, not, not all gas is equal, okay? So I know it gets sort of put down in shorthand, but, you know, gas in the Beetle Basin, all the indications are it's likely to be lower carbon uh, than other gas that's already been extracted, etc. So there's different types of gas, there's arguments about renewable gas, um, which might be feasible, et cetera. Um, so there are, there are a lot, there's a bit to go in the gas conversation about what the gas mix looks like. Having said that, um, I think I've indicated pretty strongly that I'm you know, pretty passionate about renewable energy and moving to 100%, 700% renewable energy, but it's not gonna happen overnight and nor are we gonna have the storage overnight. So as we move to a 100% renewable economy, start with on the, work, on the road to getting to 700% renewable economy, we're gonna to need to massively upgrade our storage through batteries. I've talked a little bit about that, both household, community and grid. We're seeing, we're seeing that investment now. South Australia had the world's largest battery. We're gonna have three or four batteries bigger than that around the country in the next year or so. So that's happening, plus pumped hydro, plus hydrogen. But it's not there yet and will take years to get there. Hydrogen is only just the beginning. I'm very bullish about hydrogen. I'm an optimist about hydrogen, but it's just at the beginning. It's not being used anywhere in Australia as a storage mechanism really at the moment. It's the first hydrogen power plant is in my electorate. It's just getting up and running now. It's tiny. It's not gonna contribute anything to the grid really. We're just starting out. So that's gonna take some time. So storage is important. Our opponents say oh, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, which is about as sensible as saying the rain doesn't always fall, so we can't drink water. You store water in a dam, you can store renewable energy, but that's a big process. Until and unless we have that storage up and running, we need what we call technically peaking and firming, i.e. coming into the system when we don't have enough renewables, i.e. at night, i.e. when the country's gone through a particularly non-windy period, which does happen. Now, if we are going to have that peaking and firming capacity, we really have three choices when it boils down to it. There's not, there's not many. It's gas, coal, or nuclear. Now, I'm against nuclear. It doesn't stay. Me too. Yet. Yeah. And we have lots of reasons for being against nuclear. It can be against it for moral reasons, for safety reasons, or economic reasons, because it's nuts economically. Uh, but nuclear is not a feasible option. Coal. I think I've made pretty clear there's no new coal-fired power coming in in Australia, in my view, it'll only come in if it's tax fire sub subsidised and we would oppose that with every fibre of energy we have. Um, or gas. So gas is the least worst option in the meantime while we're building that storage capacity. Now, um, the Grattan Institute's done a lot of work on this. They're pretty smart people. I don't agree with them about everything, but, you know, their work is pretty solid. They say we can get to a 90% renewable economy in Australia and we'll always need 10% gas because we just wouldn't have the storage capacity. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I'm a bit more optimistic about it. 90% is, you know, still a long way off though from where we are today. So we're going to need gas in the system for some time. That's even before we've got to what we call hard to abate sectors. You know, I have a brickwork semi-electorate. I've been through it on multiple occasions. It's a big establishment which employs a lot of people. They use a lot of gas. It can't, it, it is, you can't use electricity to make bricks. You just can't get it hot enough. Um, hopefully hydrogen steps forward to replace gas, but we're not there yet. We're gonna need a lot of gas. We're not gonna close down those brickworks. We're still building houses. 
We're still going to make cement. We're still going to make glass. We're still going to make fertilizer. Um, so they're all they're all things which require gas and are going to require gas for at least the se next several years. So gas is here to stay for a while. Now, when you say that, you annoy some people because there's two extremes to this argument. The Liberals and Nationals to our right say there's gas-fired recovery. It's not true. It's not existent. It's a fraud. And those, you know, the Greens say, let's get rid of all gas today. Sorry, neither option is viable. We just have to be honest about that. Gas has got a role to play. Hopefully, we get much more renewables, much more quickly, and we get lots of storage. But while we're doing that, gas is the less worse option. Um, okay. There are, there, I'm going to pick up on something that's in the uh, Noel Willis's question. Uh, and it is just digging a bit more deeply into uh, what's perceived as labour support for an expansion of the fossil fuel industry. And he mentions, obviously, Beedaloo Basin. But just to, to really nail the use of public funds for these things, let's just spell it out for sure. any fossil fuel stuff. Well, let's, let's just, again, I know it sometimes gets put in shorthand in the public debate, but let's just go through it. You know, I went to the Shadow Cabinet and Caucus with a clear recommendation that we should oppose any taxpayers' money going into new gas fire power. A controversial thing to recommend in um, our caucus, uh, but the caucus supported me, you know, overwhelmingly um, uh, with that recommendation. Taxpayers' yeah. money should not be spent on new coal or new gas fire power in Australia. The only way new coal or new gas fire power will work is taxpayer subsidy. And that is not where our money should be going. Our money should be going into the emerging industries, to renewable economies, to, to storage, et cetera, not to gas or to coal. So hence there'll be no, in my view, uh, no new coal fire or no new gas fire over and above what the government's committed to with their taxpayer subsidy at Curry Curry. And it wouldn't happen under us. So we are opposed to that. Um, the question goes to Beedaloo Basin again, it's long standing that there'd be some government support, not for the big guys, but for some of the smaller explorers in relation to gas. I think I've run through why gas is needed in the system, that some of the Beedaloo gas is showing potential to be a lot lower carbon uh, than other gas, which is already in the system. So look, it's I know the, um, the Greens have, have beaten up the Beedaloo Basin. I'm not saying it's unimportant, but let's not sort of say it's the be all and end all of climate policy in Australia when you consider that actually as I've said, the gas is going to have to come from somewhere. We're going to need gas in the system for some time as we transition to more renewables. But uh, the bottom line is, you know, we are against taxpayer funded subsidies for any fossil fuel energy generation in Australia. Um, now, we better talk about electric vehicles because I've written it down. And if I don't come to it now, I'm going to move on to my next sheet of paper and the other topics that are coming through. And um, I mean, last last election, the um, beat up about electric vehicles was just beyond comprehension. Um, so what's the future look like and how do we uh, enhance the future of electric vehicles as a Labor government? So, look, electric vehicles are absolutely key to us meeting our ambitions. We won't get there without them. Um, you know, transport is 14% of our emissions and, you know, we just we just need electric vehicles in Australia. We're stone cold last on electric vehicles in Australia. 0.7% of our future, of our, car, of our our car sales are electric vehicles. That's compares to 56% in Norway, um, 0 0.7 versus 56. Now, I'm not suggesting we can just jump to Norway, but we can do a lot better than 0 0.7. Um, and we need to. Uh, and part of the reason why we are, well, the only reason we're so far behind is lack of government framework policy. Now, um, at the last election, you're right, you know, it was the end of the weekend and it won't tell you about a couple of things. Firstly, I've started to announce our electric vehicle policy. Um, I'll just talk about that in a moment. But one of the things that was in the last policy, which is not in the policy I've announced and won't be is a, man, is a, a target of X percentage by X date, because frankly, Scott Morrison took that 50% by 2030 target and turn it into a compulsory mandate um it was never that i mean as if you could force people to buy electric vehicles in australia um but he sort of took it and changed it so you I don't want to just you don't just want to call it a horizon chris no and... that's right that's right we should do that um but i said about choice i want to give people the choice more choice at the moment there's no electric vehicles for sale in australia under forty thousand. there's very few under sixty they they're very expensive why because our policies are wrong 
Um, we, we, we charge taxes on electric vehicles, which other countries don't do, and we don't have the policies to encourage uh, the manufacturers to send electric vehicles to Australia. It's a complicated policy area I won't bore you with, but you know, we don't have fuel emission standards, et cetera. So what we have announced is we'll take the tariff off electric vehicles that are affordable and we will provide a fringe benefits tax concession to companies which provide electric vehicles to their employees so they won't pay FPT if they give their employees uh, an, F, uh, uh, an electric vehicle. That will really drive behaviour. That'll take $9,000 off the cost of an electric vehicle. If you're an employer and you've got a choice between an internal combustion engine car and an EV, which is now $9,000 cheaper, considering that half the car sales in Australia are fleet sales, that's really going to drive behaviour and really make a difference. Now, we've got more to announce yet on electric vehicles, but that's our offering. That's our policy to reduce the cost of EVs, and it's pretty important. Mm, yeah, I'd love to be um, able to, to role model by driving one. Uh, and yeah. Okay, uh, I am going to just pause for a moment. Now, if you like the things that you're hearing, if this sounds like they're the sorts of things you want to make happen from a government, one of the ways to do that is to support me. So this is a shameless plug. Uh, we love your donations, that's fantastic, but we also love your time. And one of the things we've been doing during COVID is doing check-ins with people. Uh, and they're um, a lovely, they're actually lovely conversations. I, I try and do a little bit each day and at weekends. Uh, and most people's conversation so if you'd like to be part of that and then going forward discussing with people more around the reasons to have these sorts of policies um there, there's plenty of opportunities to volunteer now i'm sure someone's going to put a, a link into the chat box to say here's who you contact if you'd like to help us as especially as we head into an election which is obviously looking less likely this year and more likely next year um please step forward and help uh, that's the only way I'm going to be able to get the word out as we get closer to an election about the range of things that Labor, a Labor government will be about. So there's a plug. Now, um, here's a question, Chris, from Peter Waller Bryant. We've seen modelling that $1 million invested in renewables creates 4.8 full-time full -time jobs, whereas 1 million invested in fossil fuel, fuels creates 1.7. We need to change the narrative. What more can Labor do to achieve that? Yeah, well, that modelling's right, um, and I have referred to that in other speeches I've made, um, and really, that really goes to the point I was making at the outset about how we win this argument about jobs. We have to make it about jobs in the future, and the modelling is correct about that, and that's not how the public perceives it, but we just have to, there's no easy answer, um, we just have to keep saying it, um, we, you know. Um, we, so often that Susan and I are sick of it when we say it, that's how often we have to say it, um, because that's when you know people are running busy lives. That's when we first start to be taken in by people. When Susan and I are so sick of saying it that we we feel like being sick at the thought of saying it again, that's when people are first noticing, and that's our job uh, to keep saying those sorts of things. So again, that's why. And, and I think we've shown that with quarantine and vaccinations, the things that 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 honestly you, you know you were pointing out a year ago, everyone is so sick of saying it, but we're now starting to see more people understand why we said those things a year yeah. ago. Yeah, totally. Um, um, sometimes you feel like you're whistling in the wind when I was saying we need more vaccine deals, when I was shadow minister for health, like nobody was listening to me. But if I say so myself, I don't think that view has been judged harshly by history. No, I, I think you were really on the ball then. And, um, you know, for me, as someone who's been, remember, I've been a candidate, this will be my fifth election. So I have been very focused on the various policies we've had around climate change, and they've all been policies for their time. And, and of course, I signed up to be a candidate when we were in government and we were making policy. We were legislating to take action on climate change. Um, so, you know, I think you've, you've evolved our policies really well. And last election, I said to people, oh, this is the best for me, the best set of climate change policies that I've seen from Labor, I'll be saying the same uh, next election, but they are different because the times are different. Um, okay, there are more questions and I have to stop talking. Okay, Norm Short raises the very important issue of the future for offshore wind. Mm. It, we, it's not something we see in the Blue Mountains, but it's something <laughs> we care about. 
No, totally. And Norm is 100% right to raise it. And I've been saying a lot about this. You know, um, we are one of the few countries in the world without any offshore wind, which is just crazy um, when you consider the size of our coastline and the capacity that offshore wind can provide. The reason I'm so passionate about offshore wind is really twofold. Firstly, it generates a lot of energy. It's very windy out there. And the benefit of offshore wind turbines is they can go higher um, than uh, onshore wind turbines where it's windier. So you have the situation where one turn of one turbine, so one turn of one turbine makes enough as much energy as the solar panels on your roof do all day. So one turn of one turbine and a turbine offshore wind turbine turns 15 times a minute. So that's how much energy can be created through offshore wind. Um, there is a proposal for an offshore wind farm off the Gippsland coast called Star of the South. If that was up and running today, it would generate enough electricity to fulfill 20% of Victoria's energy needs today. That's 250 turbines. Now, the other reason I'm passionate about it is that frankly, it's very labor intensive. It creates more jobs than onshore wind because you've got to have ships to go out and maintain them. Because they move so much faster, they need more maintenance. It's very job rich. So if we're going to win the argument about jobs, then why wouldn't we have offshore wind in Australia? Now, I can hear you asking perhaps, well, why don't we have offshore wind? Well, it's not currently legal. It's, there's, no, there's no regulatory framework, um, which is just nuts. Now, the government promised a regulatory framework by um, the middle of the year. Well, it's August and we still haven't seen the legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they're not fair dinkum. We've got 10 to 15 proposals around the country for offshore wind. Star of the South is the only one that's making any progress because it got an exemption from uh, the regulatory regime. And um, the others just are going nowhere. And the other, I'll just finish on this point. The other beauty of offshore wind is because it needs to feed into the grid where the grid can take it, it's off the coastal areas where traditionally there've been coal jobs. So it's off the Latrobe and Gippsland valleys. It's off the Hunter Valley, it's off the Illawarra, it's off Gladstone in central Queensland, because that's where the pipelines and the, and the grid can take it in. So again, there's a direct link between coal jobs and offshore wind. So, you know, I've said, if it's not fixed by the time we get to government, one of my first priorities would be as climate change and energy minister to fix that and get the regulatory regime and get these projects going and get the energy generated and get the jobs happening. It's happening right around the world. You go over to Europe, you see them, um, you know, normally they're 10 to 20 k's off the coast. You can only just see them. So it's not an environmental blight on the coastline in most instances. Um, it's very good energy generation and very jobs rich. Mm. Um, now, Chris, you got to meet with students from the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains this morning. Uh, and I've got a question from a young person who has been very involved in a lot of the Hawkesbury Blue Mountains student activity. And it's from Lily. Uh, and the federal court recently found that the environment minister has a duty of care to all young people when making decisions. Will you and the Labor Party formally accept this responsibility to all young people when it comes to making decisions on climate change, including the opening or expansion of gas and coal mines? Well, it's the law of the land. So, and yes, we accept it. Absolutely. Um, and uh, when the court brings down a finding, you, you respect it. And you deal with it. So yes, a Labor government would respect that uh, that finding because it's the law of the land, and so we should. Uh, now, I we are doing okay time wise. Um, it, just in, uh, and I, I haven't checked. I'm worried I haven't checked questions, and I'm missing something. Um, but I'm sure someone will text me if there's something that I have uh, left out. In terms of any other policies, you've talked about EVs, you've talked about the apprenticeship training, we've talked about rewiring the grid. What haven't we talked about? I think I mentioned solar pa uh, community batteries. Community batteries, yes. Community batteries, 400 community batteries across the country, very important um, for providing the capacity for lower income people in particular to be able to store their energy. And not just lower income people as well, um, People who can't have solar panels, maybe their renters and their landlord won't put them in. 
maybe uh, they're in strata, maybe they live in a shady place. You know, I can imagine there's places in the mountains where it's tree lined and, and a bit too shady. So the beauty of, sol of community batteries is that even if you don't have solar panels, you can pay a couple of bucks a week and take the renewable energy out at night without feeding in during the day um, because there'll be sort of surplus capacity in the, um, in, the, um, in, the, in the community battery. So that's an important one. So community batteries, electric vehicles, new energy apprentices, and rewiring the nation. Pretty, as I said, more policy detail out so far in the climate change portfolio than any other, really. Yeah. Now, here's Matt Rowan picking up on that and talking about the um, upfront costs being a specific challenge for households. And you've mentioned um, some of the areas that we can target. He's also said, um, will a Labor government look at government funded leasing options or other mechanisms to increase that adoption? Um, and he's talked about the community battery. You know, he acknowledges he and his wife have been very fortunate, but they'd love to help the area whole area green the grid so so yeah more creative options of doing that um well all i'd say is that we are looking at and have looked at various options to support low income earners. community batteries is the storage policy um but there are other things that we can do to support low income earners particularly around obviously solar energy and also importantly around energy efficiency you know um many people whom who are uh, low income live in very energy inefficient houses because they haven't had the capacity to, to upgrade their houses. And that leads to poor health outcomes for them too, because their houses are colder in winter and hotter in summer. And so they really feel the health impact. So there's all sorts of options that we've been working on. I'm not announcing them tonight, but oh, Chris, be, come on. Be, re be reassured it's on the agenda. Um, someone's just said uh, it's Robert Curtis has said but we're not yet talking about community microgrid integration into the grid or or are you well the community batteries would be connected to the grid um, if that's what the question's about but also look there is there is more more options there are more options too for renewable energy community programs um, but we're still developing those and, and look, Annette Bennett's just asked a question now. Annette is involved with the, uh, she is uh, the head of the Teachers Feds Federation's TAFE, um, uh, you know, sector. And, and she's a mountains resident. And as she says, there are plenty of electrical trades TAFE teachers currently qualified to teach renewable solar batteries installation, practical or hands-on. Um, and that obviously involves the commitment to TAFE beyond the apprenticeships that you've talked about. Uh, I guess I guess I'll just put that out there because I know oh. you and I know you and it'd be Richard Miles now as the TAFE skills person talk. Yeah, totally. And you know, um, we certainly see TAFE as front and center, not only of our climate change training policies, but you know, much more broadly, we want to reinvigorate TAFE as the essential building block of the vocational education and training system. Mm. Now, I'm just, I kept, I'm keeping an eye on time and I'm really conscious now that this is where I tend to blow out time-wise. Uh, so here's a couple of things around message. Uh, for someone who currently works in a fossil fuel generation sector, when they hear us talk about tr transition to renewables, they hear the narratives that the uh, liberals have spread, that we want to steal their job away from them. How can we, as a party, do a better job of getting people on board who are still working and living? And of course, that I'm going to add to that Judy's question, which is you can have the best policies in the world, but if you can't get the message to the voters because Murdoch won't let you, how do you counteract um, that uh, behemoth of a media organisation. So really that's all about us communicating because we had, we've had some great policies. We haven't always been able to cut through. Um, yeah. there, there's, your, there's your challenge and people desperate to know how yeah. we, we can do that. So on the first part of the question about transition, that's why I don't use the term just transition because mm -hmm. just transition, I understand what what motivates the term just transition, but it implies to me, and more importantly, implies to fossil fuel workers, that um, they're a sort of footnote to the transition, that, you know, we'll get to the jobs later, that we're going to transition to a renewable economy and there'll be retraining and, you know, you'll be okay. Um, that's not, um, 
that's not the way I see it. I see it as the other way around, that those jobs will be at the centre. So there's ways, there again, there are policies we're working on, and I think there's really, um, if you like, cut through ways that occurs to me we can communicate them uh, and explain them to traditional industries if we have the opportunity to do so. And to the question about Murdoch and you, sure, totally, but you know, that's not about the change. Uh, and all we do is fight the fight and make the arguments directly in social media and in other outlets, uh, you know, um, read the Saturday paper, read the, the Guardian, watch the ABC, get the arguments from us in those forums as well um, and spread the word. And um, when you see Susan saying something good on Facebook, press the share button um, and same on Twitter, press the retweet button and um, help us spread the word. Yeah. Okay. Now there are two questions. There's, I'm going to ask you about your 20, the, our 2030 target, but first, uh, so I want to flag so you know um, that I want to finish on that. But Merrilise, who is involved in the building industry and building passive solar and pa pure passive homes, um, just talks about building standards. Now, this came up with the young people again today around the sorts of standards for schools, things that are uh, cheap, less energy, need less energy to run and more healthy and more comfortable and obviously in the Blue Mountains, where I think we and in the Hawkesbury and across, when I say the Blue Mountains, all the areas of the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains that experience bushfire, we are experiencing climate change as are those on the plains who are experiencing unusual levels of rainfall that, that lead to flooding. Um, so Meryl Lees is saying, you know, better building standards is something that we really need. You and I discussed this morning, some of this rests with the state, but how at a federal level, what could we do to be improving those and, and encouraging that, that yeah. take up? Yeah, so Marilise is 100% right. Um, there is potential there and I have been looking at this policy area. So as Marilise would know, there's a thing called the National Construction Code. It does have some requirements for energy efficiency and renewable energy, um, but you know they're not perfect uh they're not strong um there's no no requirement to have electric vehicle charging capacity for example so there's things that uh, i have considered and i'm and am considering um the national construction code is a joint um venture between the commonwealth and the states so you need to bring people with you uh if you're proposing a change to that um it has been updated at various points over the last few years to reflect more uh, the need and imperative um, to have more energy efficient homes and more renewable energy generation. Of course, you would let, open yourself up to the scare campaign from those who would argue, oh, our house is going to be so much more expensive because, you know, Bowen's put all these requirements in. You know, so, you know, you need to think that through, but um, uh, it is something that we are considering. Mm. Okay, and let's finish with 2030 target because that's what a lot of people are asking about that. So, look, you know, um, I've said that Net zero by 2050 is the essential starting point. It's not the be-all and end-all. We need a strong um, roadmap to get there. That includes targets. You know, that includes um, uh, indications as to how we'll be going at midpoints, including 2030 and 2035. Um, I'll be saying more about this in the coming period in the lead up to, to Glasgow. Um, so that's, uh, that's really what, uh, what I think I should say tonight because there is more to say. I simply say that our existing target is, of course, Tony Abbott's target. That's the country's target, is Tony Abbott's target. Three pri two prime ministers later, and Tony Abbott's a climate change denier. So, you know, his biggest contribution to Australian public life was wrecking climate policy, and we're still living with these targets. By the way, targets which I won't meet either. This is not unimportant. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm really conscious that you need to go and to your next meeting. Yes, and well, I, I apologise if I have overlooked something that's been text through to me. Um, that's on me. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I have seen a couple of people have had to dash, but I think we've most of you have stayed. I hope you found it a useful conversation. And Chris, thank you. Um, you will see there will be other questions that come from the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains and we look forward to hosting you maybe in real life. Well, I'd love that. And Susan, just before I go, because I've got another Zoom uh, shortly with our friend and colleague, Terry Butler, 
talking to people in Queensland, um, which is important. But I just want to thank you for putting this on, Susan, but also to um, say to the people on the Zoom, you have, there is no better federal member of parliament than Susan Templeman. There is not one. Uh, nobody is a more effective local member, a stronger advocate for progressive causes. Uh, so one, we need Susan to hold her seat to form a government because we need more seats, but we need to hold the ones we currently do. So that's important. Mm. If, you want a, if you want a better climate change policy for Australia, you need to change the government. Uh, and we need Susan there in that. And even more importantly than that, you know, I can't imagine a Labor government without, without Susan as part of it, holding us to account and pushing, it, pushing us to do better. And she just does that so effectively. There is, as I said, no more effective MP. So please, if Susan asks you to support her campaign, the correct answer is yes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and look, I think the other thing that strikes me is I know the same things you're saying here are going to be the same things you're saying in Queensland because our policy is consistent you know warts and all honesty uh, and good thought behind it so thank you for the work you're doing thanks so much thank and thank you everybody I'll let Chris escape thanks all if you have any follow-up questions thanks Chris feel free to email me um, and we will just, I will just keep uh, feeding through your thoughts and your concerns and your priorities on this. Uh, Cause I, I, we, we can really make a difference if we can get into government and actually make stuff happen. And I want to do it to give hope to our young people as well. So thank you. I think, I think it's now, now time to start going, appreciate you all very much being here on what I believe is a Monday night. Take care and talk soon.